I get asked a lot about where did the global financial crisis go? Did this help us? Because we know that when uh, Russia uh, collapsed, uh, when the end of uh, the Soviet era, its carbon emissions plummeted. Yes. Well, there was a little dip, and then um, guess what? Everybody caught up because business then started to accelerate, so we're back to where we were. We're still on a business as usual. But I'm going to come back to how we're going to solve this crisis, because I'm not going to leave you with the depression, okay? I'm going to make sure you're optimistic by the end, okay? <laughs> okay? Okay? I, I am an optimist. But I want to talk about why climate change is a problem for society, okay? Because we hear about some warming, it might get a bit wetter. Yeah, is that really that bad? So here, I've just plotted up some weather. Okay, so this is weather, uh, you know, it could be wetter, colder, doesn't matter, it goes up and down. Now, um, if you squint at it, you can probably see I've cheated. There's a little bit of change in there, okay? So I'll put some lines in there. So those are the averages, okay? So there's a little bit of climate change in there, okay? So, what people forget is that each of our societies has a coping range, okay? So we know that actually we don't have to worry so much about snow in Florida, so we don't have snow plows here, okay? In the UK, we don't have huge heat waves or hurricanes, so we don't have to prepare for them. So each society has their own coping range. When weather becomes problematic is when it just pops out of the top of that. We get an extreme flood, or we get a heat wave that's beyond what we usually get, okay? And this is the insidious nature of climate change, because what happens is, if the coping range of your society does not change, the number of these extreme events seems to increase. I'll give you an example. Hurricanes. The hurricanes, very familiar for this part of the country, and also you can see how different countries adapt. So, for example, Cuba regularly gets hit by um, hurricanes, but they've lost something like 15 people in the last 50 years because they have incredibly strict building regulations and evacuation plans. Okay? So you can adapt to most weather. I'll give you another one about coping range, because this will make you laugh. Okay? In London, where I'm from, heat-related deaths recorded by medics start at 26 degrees Celsius. In Florida, you call that spring, okay? So again, different coping ranges, different coping zones, okay? So what has happened to the US? So the US recent climate change, this is the last 10 years compared with the previous 100 years. You can see that there's been significant warming through most of the US. This then has led to a number of extreme events. Some of you may be familiar with this. So this is the 2014 heat wave and drought in California. As you can see, by May, we have exceptional conditions through almost the whole state. These events are going to become more likely and more common, okay? And we need to adapt to those to protect our people. If we look at the future, and I've put the four models up here, and by the way, all of you can access this data, okay? The one thing about climate change is it's all open, the data is all there, you can go and have a look for yourself. And the US National Climate Assessment is an incredibly detailed document that gives you any information you want to know about climate change, and also on a state-by-state -state basis, okay? So if you run a business, and you want to actually understand how climate change is going to affect your business, it has state-by-state -state, uh, assessments so you can actually assess the risks. So as you can see, depending on whether we top left, we stick to two degrees, or we go for the business as usual, makes a huge difference in the number of areas that increase in temperatures. So if we take a ballpark figure, where I think realistic we are, we are looking at five to six degrees Fahrenheit warming by the end of the century. Okay? Now that's quite a lot, if you think about it, if you're going to deal with that on the average. 
If we look at uh, changes in heavy precipitation over the last 20 years compared with the previous, you can see that there are marked changes, particularly in the northeast and the uh, southeast. Okay. A recent NOAA study showed that the Louisiana flooding, such as the one that happened uh, in 2016 in August, are now twice as likely to occur. So therefore, we need to be able to plan to build um, safeguards for people in these areas. We have an increased hurricane risk in the Atlantic Ocean. As you can see on the left, the power of the hurricanes is starting to increase from about the mid-80s through to now. And I'm going to give you a, an example from my own hometown because there are flood risks all around the world because of not just sea level rise but also changing in storm tracks. And so this is the idea of having a storm surge coming down the North Sea and then hitting London. Top left is the beautifully designed uh, Thames barrier, which can actually close to stop the water coming up the Thames. Now, this is a representation from a TV show that was shown a couple of years in England. It was one, uh, one of the channels that doesn't use exciting titles. It was called Flood. <laughs> yes, well, you know, we're not very inventive in the UK. But as you can see, there's the Houses of Parliament right in the center, uh, same as Capitol Hill, being flooded by huge deluge of water. Now, I can reassure you that this is very unlikely to happen, even by the end of the century, because the UK Environment Agency doesn't matter what politicians say. They have a mandate to protect the people. They have plans, and financial plans of how to do it, to protect London up to a four-meter rise in sea level. And the nice thing is, if you go into your local areas, you know that your state have plans like this, and also the EPA have plans to protect you. So it's very interesting that whatever rhetoric you have at the top, the people underneath who are mandated to protect you understand the science, and clearly get it, and are trying to do their best to protect you. But again, it'd be much easier, much cheaper, if we actually reduced the actual impact to start with. So of course, sea level rise wouldn't just affect uh, the UK and the US, it would flood many other countries. And I'm going to give you one example, which I find continually terrifying. So, this is Bangladesh, and before you think that this is Western scientists or US scientists saying, hey, this is what's going to happen to this poor country, this is actually work done by the Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies. It's their own scientists who clearly understand their country, looking at the possible impacts. Now, they've modeled a conservative one meter rise in relative sea level. Now, why is that conservative? The first thing is, it's only 50 centimeters of sea level rise due to global warming, okay, which is our, on the lower end of our predictions. But there's also half a meter of sinkage. The problem is Bangladesh is a delta, and because India has actually dammed all the major rivers around Bangladesh to produce cheap, clean hydroelectric power, since the irony coming on here, um, they have also used the delta to extract clean drinking water for their population. There's about 10,000 tube wells. Of course, when you take fresh water out of a delta, it sinks. And so they think about half a meter of sinkage is going to occur by the end of the century. And this is what they predict is going to happen to their country with a one meter rise in sea level. That's 25% of their country underwater and then you have to think that, of course, uh, the areas adjacent to that land will have salt intrusion and still won't be able to actually produce food. So, global warming, as it used to be called, and now we refer to it climate change, a lot of it's due to having too much or too little water. We also hear in the news there's coral bleaching, there's problems uh, whereby too hot conditions can actually affect uh, corals. And we know that there is a loss of biodiversity, firstly because of us, but climate change will then affect cloud forests, Arctic regions, and wetlands. 
So for the first half of this talk, I'm just going to sum up the problems with climate change and the challenge we face. And then I'm going to talk about where the population is uh, to blame. And actually, I'm going to give you some solutions so you can feel slightly better about our future, okay?